Hello and welcome to our online patient meeting. It is me, Caroline, again, and uh, well, happy to see uh, some familiar faces. And uh, Dr. Vladimiro, hi, how are you feeling today? I'm fine, thank you. Hi, Caroline, thanks for hi. having me. It's a pleasure to be here sharing our experience with everybody. Happy to have you as well. And please let, let us know that you can hear us uh, loud and clear so we can make sure. Thank you. Someone is typing. So all is good, I believe. So mm -hmm. uh, let me just quickly remind you that we are here simply because we want to make sure that you will have a chance to ask your question to top experts since we are at this point cannot proceed with any of the treatments uh, it is your time to get connected with some of the best doctors but also get to know uh, different options get to know some different doctors from various clinics in different countries and today uh, we are having another topic to uh, talk about to discuss which is uh, of course important and the stronger together initiative is also possible and brought to you thanks to our ambassador ambassadors and partners. So again, I would like to thank them for their support. And you can see them all right here on the screen. Uh, so huge thanks to all of them. Without them as well, it wouldn't be possible. Uh, so let me go to our topic today. And it is, as I've already have mentioned, um, this is Dr. Vladimir Silva. He's the IVF lab director and founder of Ferti Central Clinic, which is located in Portugal. And he will today talk about IVF and pregnancy after 40. And again, we will just start with short introduction from Dr. Vladimir, and then we will go for the most common questions after that, it will be your time to ask your questions. Remember, you can type them all in in the chat section. And uh, well, Dr. Vladimir will uh, answer them and help you out as much as possible, I am sure. Uh, OK, so Dr. Vladimir, are you ready to begin? Yes, of course. Please go ahead, Caroline. Ask me everything. Um, well, I will just do a, a very small introduction. Um, I'm coming from Portugal. Uh, you are telling me that this is the first time you get someone f uh, who is working in Portugal um, doing this kind of live events. Um, so Portugal is a very nice country to do IVF these days because we have um, this very recent uh, and very patient-friendly legislation uh, recently, we've moved on from anonymous donors into non-anonymous donations, uh, which is uh, a big advantage not only for um, the intended parents, but also for, for the children born from donations. Um, and so I would uh, and we have uh, other things uh, that are important, like uh, the ability to do egg donation treatments, PGPA. I think we're going to talk a lot about that. Um, and so, I mean, I believe that the difference between Portugal and the other countries with this kind of legislation is that we do have donors here, while in other countries there are not so many donors. Uh, we can talk a little bit about that. Uh, I'm talking about donors because when we talk about pregnancy, after the age of 40, that's a recurrent question. It's not the only option. Um, we can assess, um, uh, we have to assess every patient individually, uh, but um, but obviously I think those questions will arrive and so we'll, we will take it step by step. So Caroline, I don't know if you want to ask me anything else. <laughs> Yes, definitely. Uh -huh. We can start with the questions. I'm sure we will have lots of questions after this as well. So uh, let's go to the uh, most common questions first. And the first one is, are there a lot of women getting pregnant after the age of 40? Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, actually, it is very interesting because um, before doing this presentation, I did some research exactly on those numbers. And it is very uh, curious to see that uh, while uh, a few years ago, uh, we, I mean, uh, in, 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 the, in the 60s, uh, we already had a lot of patients getting pregnant uh, after the age of 40. But, uh, and now we are, um, the number of 
of people getting pregnant after the age of 40 is more or less the same number of patients who are getting pregnant after the age of 40 uh, in the 60s and the 50s. And uh, it seems like a contradiction, but it is not the problem. The difference is that in the 60s, uh, people were getting pregnant at the age of 40, but they were having like their fourth, their third, their fifth, their sixth kid. Uh, here, the di nowadays, the difference is that patients are getting their first kid after the age of 40. This is a consequence, a consequence of our lifestyle uh, these days for professional reasons, for personal reasons. Everybody is delaying pregnancy. And sometimes it is not rare that we see a 48-year-old patient getting to the clinic and saying, I want I've finally met someone with whom I'm prepared to have a kid. Um, and so, uh, I mean, uh, she's 48, so it's very complicated. Um, so um, it's a reality of our lifestyle, of our times. Uh, the difference when, when we are comparing the current situation with what happened a few years ago is that now it's time to have the first baby after the 40, while uh, a few years ago, a lot of people were having her fourth, fifth kid uh, after the, the, the age of 40 and without medical help. <laughs> okay. Perfect. Thank you so much for answering this uh, question and giving us uh, some details. Uh, sorry, uh, Caroline, there's here a question from Joanne uh, Brownlow. Yes, uh, we will get to it. Okay, ah, so don't okay, worry, okay. I will be showing all the questions uh, okay, right okay. after this. Yeah, thank okay, you. That's perfect. I'll let you guide in the. Um... No problem. <laughs> Okay. Let's go to the next question that we have. What's the best option after 40 than Onex or egg donation? Well, it depends. Um, first of all, we have to think, uh, we, ha we have to assess every case individually. Uh, if you ask me what's the, the less risky option, it is clear that egg donation has le uh, is less risky because uh, the, the age-related genetic risk depends on the age of the egg. And so if we're having uh, an IVF treatment with a, uh, the egg of a 25-year-old woman, uh, we're having the same risks that we have at the age of 25. Uh, if, uh, well, if you are having uh, pre uh, treatment with your own eggs at the age of 42, uh, it will be the risks at 42, which are significantly higher. Uh, obviously, the risk is of uh, is it's what we call we have two types of risk we're talking about the genetic risk meaning the risk of having an egg with a chromosomal abnormality and then we have the obstetric risks um, which are always there regardless of whether we're trying with own eggs or egg donation so between own eggs and egg donation Egg donation is certainly less risky. However, a trying with own eggs can also be safe, especially if we use, for example, uh, pre-implantation genetic testing. Uh, the, this way, we can be sure that the um, we can we can never be sure because all techniques have limits. But we can assess whether an embryo has a normal chromosomal constitution or not. Um, we nowadays we're using next generation sequencing which is a technique at the blastocyst stage, uh, which is a technique very uh, that allows us great levels of accuracy. Um, and so we, at the end of the day, we, we can uh, re respond to the patients with a very small margin of errors, of error, whether their embryos are viable or not. If they are uh, viable, chances of having a chromosomal abnormality are not null, null because the, in medicine we don't talk about zero, but they are certainly very little. So uh, transferring a normal, what we call a nuploid embryo, uh, to, 
to obtain from a woman after the age of 40 yields more or less the same pregnancy rate, a little, uh, almost the same pregnancy rate as transferring a, a donated egg. So if the ovaries of the patients are still working, if the patient wants to try to, and to do the pre-implantation genetic testing, it's certainly a way uh, of making sure that the treatment is safe, that, uh, that the risk of having a baby with, uh, with a chromosomal abnormality will be lower. Hello, Caroline. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I am here. Thank okay. you so much uh, for answering the next mm. our next question. And let's get to here. Can PGTA really make a difference? Well, uh, uh, it is not. Uh, it's a hard question. Normally, uh, I would say that. Um, uh, normally, uh, I was actually this afternoon, I was talking to a patient um, from France and she asked me the exact same question. Uh, my answer was no. Uh, and I will explain. Um, no, because the embryo would still be the same. Okay, so PGTA is about getting information. So if the embryo is a good embryo, uh, it will always be a good embryo. If the embryo is an, uh, a bad embryo, meaning if it carries some genetic abnormality, some chromosomal abnormality, um, we can do PGTA, but the embryo, we cannot transform a bad embryo into a good one. Okay, so uh, PGTA uh, will give us information, and in that sense, it does make a difference because it is very important in terms of making a decision. It, uh, it's very important to make sure whether we're transferring viable embryos or not. However, PGTA doesn't change the genetic status of the embryo. Okay, and that's very important because sometimes patients come to us and say, let's do a PGTA so we can be sure we will have a viable embryo to transfer into the womb. It's not like that. Uh, sometimes all of the embryos are genetically abnormal or have chromosomal abnormalities. Uh, so, um, PGTA is very important to inform us about embryo quality, and it is also very important to help patients deciding whether they should try and, and resource to egg donations or whether it's worth to keep trying with their own eggs. Also, the PGTA plays a very important role um, in another kind of situations. For example, uh, this was a, another case from yesterday. I was talking to another to to some other patients. They were telling me that they have tried. Uh, I mean, it was. Uh, five times with different uh, in different countries uh, with always with their own eggs and they have transferred a total of 10 embryos lots of blastocysts uh, i think it was seven blastocysts and uh, always with negative results in that case pgt would be a pgta would certainly be very important because we nowadays we don't know whether there is a problem, let's say, with the window of implantation uh, for that woman, or uh, if it is just a question of um, uh, that the embryos are not genetically normal. So if the embryos uh, have a normal uh, chromosomal constitution, in that case, we should focus our investigations in the genetics uh, of the endometrium, the window of implantation, immunitary factors, hematological factors, uh, microbiota. I mean, there are lots of things to be evaluated um, rather than the genetic quality of the embryo. So in that sense, PGTA can also help us to direct the investigation uh, towards the, the, the identification of the reason of previous failure. Okay, so this is about decision making, not about changing the status of the embryo. Unfortunately, we cannot make eggs and sperm in the lab. We just have to work with what we have. All right, perfect. Thank you so much for your explanation to that a very important question. And let's get to the next one. While using egg donation, is it preferable to have an open egg donor or anonymous one? Well, um, 
I'm relatively suspect to talk about this because uh, I'm, I come, I'm coming from Portugal and in Portugal we have uh, open donations. Uh, but I can tell you um, my... Uh, my, uh, I, I will share you a story because it is how things happen in our country and I've changed my mind uh, about this. Initially um, in Portugal until April 2018, which it was actually, uh, it's, it's two years ago today, so it's uh, what a coincidence. Uh, until two years ago today, uh, donations were strictly anonymous in Portugal. Um, and then uh, from a day to the other, uh, out of the blue, no one was expecting that the Constitutional Court decided that donors should no, not, should no longer be anonymous. Even treatments that were scheduled for the next day had to be interrupted because donors would have to agree to be non-anonymous. Okay, so it was a very sudden and unexpected move. Uh, we were completely against it. We, and when I say we, I, I would say that is the scientific community. There were debates on national newspapers, TV shows, social networks, I mean, public events about that. And uh, uh, most of the IVF doctors and embryologists were against that change in the law. But then um, we, obviously, and there was nothing we could do because it was the highest country, uh, court in the country. Uh, and so it was a final decision. There was no, pos no possibility of appeal. So we had to work with this new reality. And so we started talking with our donors. And it was amazing to see that 97% of all uh, of our egg donors accepted to be non-anonymous. 70% uh, of our sperm donors also accepted that. Uh, on the other hand, and it was a very surprising effect, the number of donors peaked. We've never had this many donors. It is a paradox. We were not expecting that, but we have, for example, we have an egg bank in our two clinics in Porto and Coimbra. Um, we have about 3,000 eggs in our egg bank. We have thousands of sperm straws as well, all from non-anonymous donors all obtained in the last two years. Um, and so, uh, and then we started talking uh, to patients. And we, real, we, we, we came to realize that uh, it is, uh, it's, not, uh, it, it's about giving options to the families. So if some family wants the donor to be anonymous, uh, they are not, uh, they can, the donor can be anonymous. So it's, uh, when we use uh, an anonymous donor, uh, it's like we're closing a door forever. This door will never be, be open again. Um, when we're using an open donor, it's a door uh, that's still closed, but at the age of 18, uh, the, um, the child uh, born from the donation will have the right to request information on the, the ID of the donor to the national IVF authorities. So this gives a lot of options to the families, a lot of options uh, to, to the children born. This is a guarantee from the Portuguese state. This means that uh, we uh, even if a clinic closes, that information will always be available uh, and it will be available for 75 years. It will also be very important if for some health reason it is necessary to contact the donor. Um, and so uh, if the child at the age of 18, he doesn't want to meet his donor or her donor, uh, he or she could change his mind and, and, um, and at the age of 40, she can get access to that information. So um, uh, I think it is more about having options. So I'm definitely in favor of open donors because um, it's up to the families and, and especially to the children born from the donations to decide what they want for their future, what they want to do with their life. And so uh, it's their decision. It's not up to us, up to the doctors, up to the intended parents to, to put uh, conditions on that. Obviously, uh, it's, it's the families uh, who have the power to decide. If someone says, 
uh, I don't even want to tell my kid uh, that he he was born from sperm donation. Okay, that's acceptable. It's a private decision, uh, and um, uh, and then the donor will be anonymous forever. So, uh, but one can have that opinion initially, uh, but we can change our mind in a year or in two years or uh, in 20 years. So um, uh, it's about taking, it's the difference between having an irreversible decision or something that we can change our mind about and especially leave the options open for the children that are yet to be born. And that particular information can have an impact on their health. And in that case, it is it gets more serious because it is about having information that can be very important if for some uh, unfortunate reason it is necessary to contact the donor. Perfect. Fantastic. Indeed, very, very interesting. And I guess I'm not the only one who would think that there are not so many donors. So definitely, um, thank you for sharing that. Uh, mm -hmm. Very interesting indeed. And let's go to the next question. I've always wanted a large family. Is there still time? Uh, well, it depends on your age. Um, normally, I would say yes. Well, it, uh, I mean, it, uh, here in Portugal, we can treat patients up to the age of 50, uh, which is which means uh, 49 years and three, 364 days. So on the day of their 50th anniversary, it's no longer possible. Uh, however, uh, even for when a patient reaches the age of 50, we have the right to transfer the embryos created in the 12 months before that barrier. So uh, if that's the case, uh, we, we can still transfer frozen embryos uh, after that age, uh, at least in the first 12 months after the creation of the embryos. Um, uh, normally, uh, we get that question a lot because uh, some patients, uh, let's say they are 42, they want a large family. Uh, egg donation is certainly the best option. There are solutions where we can create, obviously, Typically, in an egg donation cycle, we get a lot of embryos, like five or six. And, I mean, our average number of embryos is certainly, in an egg donation cycle, it's certainly around four or five embryos. Uh, so that will give a, a immediately a, a large chance of having a, a big family. And also there's a possibility of banking the eggs from the same donor. So if the donor agrees to donate again, if we have more eggs from her, we can save those eggs for, for, further, for, um, for further attempts. And in that case, uh, we have patients having, uh, at Ferti Centro, we have a patient who had four kids with us, uh, all of them after the age of 45, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. So, um, obviously, through egg donation and, none, uh, and in four different pregnancies, okay? So, um, it's... Mm, uh, it happens. Uh, we can have a lot of kids. Um, in, I mean, it was one twin pregnancy and two single pregnancies. There is it. But but just to to let you know, uh, in that case, especially when we are working with egg donation, that possibility still exists. Um, obviously, if we are trying with the patient's own eggs after the age of forty. It's very unlikely that we get a lot of eggs or a lot of good quality embryos uh, that allow the patients to have a, a large family. But I mean, we can try. Uh, we can try as much as we can. But in that case, egg donation, or, or in some cases, patients have their first child with their own eggs and then they try with egg donation. Um, and so, most of the in most of the cases, there's still time. Perfect. Thank you so much again yeah. for answering this question and providing all the details as well. And so are there solutions for single women and lesbian couples? Uh, of course, I'm very happy to talk about this subject as well, because um, here in Portugal, we have 
um, and like I said in the beginning, uh, a very patient-friendly legislation. Uh, single women and lesbian couples are allowed to, to do IVF treatments. Um, and so uh, in the case of single women, uh, we, can even, uh, we can use donor sper sperm or double donation if they, are, um, if they require that. Um, and so uh, until the age of 49. Uh, in the case of lesbian couples, things are more uh, interesting because uh, the Portuguese legislation has some unique features. Well, first of all, uh, here, um, lesbian couples, uh, they don't have to be married to access uh, reproductive, um, to, to access IVF treatments. Uh, so, the, and the, our legislation gives both elements of the couple exactly the same rights over the, over the embryos. This means that, for, let's say, a lesbian couple creates, uh, is doing, IVF with donor sperm, uh, and then they have uh, five embryos. They transfer the embryos to one embryo to one of them, she gets pregnant. Uh, the other four embryos, they belong to both elements of the couple. If they divorce, the, the destination of those embryos uh, has to be defined by both elements of the couple, regardless of who gets pregnant or who donates the egg. Uh, okay, so um, regardless of we, whose DNA is that, uh, they both have the exact same rights over the embryos, like it happens in a, with a heterosexual couple. So this is truly a shared project for lesbian couples. And obviously we can have the reciprocal IVF or shared motherhood or ROPA method technique that allows one of the... Um, one of the ladies to be pregnant with her partner's ex. Uh, so once we have the embryos from this couple, they can either be transferred to one or another uh, person in the couple. Uh, and our legislation previews that exactly and allows, uh, and we have specific uh, informed consent forms for that. And obviously, if the kid, the children, the child is registered in Portugal, um, they both have the exact same parental rights over uh, over the ch the child, and they have the exact same rights over the embryos. So, uh, in some countries, for example, the embryo belong belongs to the to the woman who gave the egg, uh, while here it always belongs to both elements of the couple. On top of this, especially uh, a lot of single women and a lot of lesbian couples, they ask us for uh, identifiable donors. It's not like they are looking to, to find a, uh, a father to their kid. It's just because uh, it is pretty obvious for the children that uh, for the child that he or she were born from donation. Um, and so they want to give them the possibility of having access to the ID of the donor. Uh, that's very important for most of them. Uh, I would. It's very. It's actually very rare that one of these single women or lesbian couples requests us to use uh, anonymous donors. Um, but uh, so um, I think there are plenty of solutions. Uh, and nowadays, with our, I would say, very modern legislation, uh, we everything is very. Uh, they are very protected in terms of their legal rights over the embryos and also uh, or on her parental rights. Perfect. Thank you again okay. for answering all those questions. That was actually our uh, last question from those common ones. So therefore, we will go ahead with uh, your questions. Just let me remind you that if you would like to find out something, this is your chance to ask Dr. Vladimir. So go ahead and type in your question. And let's go to the very first question that we have. You saw it already. Uh, so are there a lot of women getting pregnant after 50? Uh, unfortunately not. Um, we, the legislation in Portugal changed uh, regarding female age changed in the beginning of 2018. So back then we were accepting uh, patients until the age of 52. Um, and we had a lot of, I mean, the, from a biological point of view, um, the, the odds of having a pregnancy stays the same regardless, as long as the uterus is okay. Um, so um, it will be 
uh, it would be biologically possible. The obstetric risks will increase. Okay, that's uh, that's for sure. However, if a patient with a good pregnancy follow up with a uh, patient taking good care of herself, following very strictly the directions of the gynecologist, uh, I think that uh, that will be um, that would be possible and safe. Right now, due to our legislation constraint, the only cases where we can get women getting pregnant after the age of 50 will be in those cases where the embryos are created before and they are within the 12 month period that we have to transfer those embryos. Uh, and for, so unfortunately for Joanne, the answer will be not in Portugal. There are some countries though where that could be possible. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And actually, uh, there was a follow-up, but you have already mentioned that law has changed. Yes, it was 52. And that's why, here's the question, do you think the age will be increased? Uh, well, the, that 52 limit was uh, the limit that we used in our own clinic. Uh, oh, it was, okay. There was no formal limit in the law. Um, I know that there are countries who, like... Uh, in some clinics in Spain, they accept patients older than that. Uh, in Cyprus, uh, in the United States, um, but uh, those countries that don't have a formal limit, normally each clinic has its own limit. But generally speaking, Euro in European, uh, in the European countries, I would say that 50 is usually the, the most common limitation. Thank you okay. for clarifying that. And uh, let's go to the next question. So to prevent poor quality of eggs, do you suggest freezing earlier than the age of 30? Um, yes, well, it will depend, but uh, the general response would be yes. So nowadays it is very important to stress that the um, uh, since the in, in the beginning of 2013, the American Society for Reproductive Medicine issued the practice committee report stating that egg freezing should no longer be considered as an experimental procedure, but could be routinely offered to patients since it was, since it was safe. And the pregnancy rates and um, live births that we were getting from uh, eggs from younger women were very similar to those obtained with fresh eggs, obviously, as long as we've mastered the vitrification techniques. Uh, so uh, now, uh, at our, I mean, worldwide, there are several vitrification techniques that work very well. Uh, we're getting uh, survival rates above 90% for frozen eggs. So it's definitely a solution. So uh, we, uh, I, I'm a strong advocate for uh, for a, for social egg freezing because I think that's certainly a way to 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 preserve fertility in women. Obviously, we have to bear in mind that uh, in the best case scenario, those eggs will not be used will never be used okay so every woman should try to get pregnant as early as possible with her own eggs uh, and naturally um, and using her fresh eggs if preferable those eggs uh, those frozen eggs are there just as, as a backup should uh, infertility comes later in her life should the need to resource to a, a neck donor comes uh, comes up so i mean uh, those eggs are for women to use as if they were their own egg donors okay because if they collect their eggs at the age of 25 and then at 45 they are trying to have a baby those eggs will still be there those eggs will have in principle uh, the same properties that they had 20 years before and so um, she will be it's like she will be her own egg donor so uh, there i think it is important if someone as not a, a perspective of having the right partner or or um, 
for, I mean, economical reasons. I mean, there there are lots of things that can happen in life these days, uh, uh, and they cannot move on with the pregnancy. Uh, I I do think that egg freezing is a very good solution, especially nowadays with such good uh, odds of survival. Obviously, when we're talking about the 90% survival chance, we're also talking about 10% non-survival chance. So most of these eggs would not be, uh, a lot of these eggs will not be viable. And so this is why we should uh, use them as a last resource uh, should they be needed. Okay. Thank you so much again for yeah. the details to this. Uh, very interesting, very important as well for many, many women. Thanks so much. Yeah. Let's go to the next question. Uh, for egg donation in your country, do you have eggs from tall blonde women? I am six foot blonde with green eyes. And my husband is asking this question because he wants our child to have some of these features from me. Uh, of course, uh, I mean, um, uh, I, I don't know if you have ever been to Portugal, <laughs> but, uh, well, uh, we have to acknowledge that the typical Portuguese person is not that tall, uh, and we're not a country known to have tall blonde women, okay? Uh, however, we do have donors from all phenotypes, for example, in our clinic, we have donors uh, with six foot, six foot, so uh, that's that's not a problem. Um, but uh, I mean, while we have, uh, if we're talking about, uh, let me, uh, we we use uh, in Portugal we use the metric system, so I will say it in meters. Uh, if we're looking for a one meter sixty donor, which would be something like uh, five five feet uh, five feet three or five three or something like that, uh, we will certainly have a lot uh, of available donors, a lot more donors. But we do have tall blonde women. But especially, and this is the the most important information, uh, when patients ask us for a donor we always give them the donor characteristics beforehand. So the patient has to accept that donor. Uh, it's not like uh, I'm giving you donor number one, two, three, four, five, and then you will see how the child is. No, patients have to be to agree with the donor that we're offering them, um, and they uh, and they have to be happy and completely committed to the process. Uh, we can't disclose the donor's ID, obviously, but we can uh, we can share information on the donor phenotype. If this person is uh, six foot blonde with green eyes, uh, I will probably, and this is a totally random example, uh, I would probably tell her, uh, well, we have a donor, she's 5'8", uh, okay, uh, with blue eyes and she's blonde uh, and she, her blood group is 8+, plus. she's 25, uh, would that be okay with you? Um, uh, if she says, well, I do need her to be at least six foot, uh, I would say, okay, let's find a six foot donor then. Um, we have a huge database of donors. Uh, we have more than 2,000 donors registered in both of our clinics, and we're getting new donors every month. So obviously our population, our average eight is a lot lower than the Nordic countries and the Netherlands and so on. But uh, we do have some, some occasional donors that are very tall. And we also have, because in Coimbra, which is where Ferti Center is based, and in Porto, um, we also have uh, a huge university community where we get patients, we, where we get donors from all nationalities. We've had donors from Germany, from Spain, from Italy, from, from Ukraine, from Russia, from France, uh, from England, uh, so um, from Brazil, lots of them, from Angola, I mean, we have uh, donors from all nationalities uh, and so uh, usually we always find a way obviously i'm not gonna lie <laughs> we don't have um, as many six feet donor uh, donors as we have for normal uh, portuguese size donors 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much again Thank for you. answering this question and uh, letting us know how it works. And so if I may ask, do you are you able to find out what is the nationality of the donor as well? Yes, we we always okay. share that as well. Perfect. Thank you so much for that. So, there are no sorry, uh, Caroline. There are no surprises. Okay, we uh, we don't move on with the, the donation treatment without having the approval uh, of the intended parents. So they have to agree. They have to be happy with the donor proposition, and so they have to be fully committed to, to the process. Uh, we will not impose the donor uh, without having their approval. That's the take home message here. Perfect. Thanks so much for confirming this to us. The next question is a bit longer, so let's have a look. I am 39 and had three failed embryo implantation. I have now three frozen embryos for transfer after COVID allows with controlled cycle. I wanted to know if we can do chromosome testing on frozen embryos and what can I do to improve the chances of implantation? Um, okay. Um... Uh, so we um, uh, let me see if I understand. So uh, Daniela, she has uh, she has three frozen embryos that she didn't transfer because of this COVID nineteen crisis. Uh, she wants to know whether we can do chromosome testing on, on those frozen embryos. Uh, the answer is yes, okay? Uh, even if they are frozen at the blastocyst stage, we can warm those embryos, we can do the chromosomal testing, and then we have to refreeze the embryos and transfer them light. Uh, we, we have done that several times. Uh, there are uh, with babies born, so uh, yes, it is still possible. Obviously, it is not the ideal, okay? We prefer to, bio, to do the embryo biopsy, which is the step required for the chromosomal testing before freezing the embryos for the first time. But this is not something unusual. Uh, we have done that a lot and, uh, and, we'll, and with success. So that's definitely something that we can do. And what can she do to improve the chances of implantation? Um, well, in this case, uh, I will. There are many options. Uh, the first step would be to know to check whether the embryos are genetically viable or not. If the embryos uh, have a normal chromosomal constitution, uh, that's the first step. Th those would be great news. And then we would focus on the endometrium because if she already had three failed embryo transfers. So we need to know uh, where is the problem. If the problem is not the embryos, because, I mean, if the, some of these three uh, is vi are viable, uh, this probably means that some of the previously transferred embryos were also viable. And so in this case, we should focus our investigation in the endometrium. Normally, we say that uh, while studying for implanta uh, implantation failures, while uh, searching the causes for implantation failures, we always uh, check for several factors. Gynecological factors like fibroids, like uterine abnormalities, uh, malformations, etc. We can do that in an ultrasound scan and also in an hysteroscopy. Then we can check the window of implantation, which is a very important factor. Uh, and I'm sure some other speakers have addressed this in, in, some, in some of the other communications. Um, uh, the window of implantation has become more and more important these days. We know that after five days of progesterone, the endometrium is ready to receive a day five embryo. However, in some patients, uh, after five days of progesterone, the endometrium is still not ready, or in the other way around, uh, the endometrium is no longer ready. But by doing a biopsy after five days of uh, an endometrial biopsy, after five days of progesterone, we can test. Uh, there are several tests like the ERA test, the ERA map. There are several tests in the market. Um, we, we can, the WIND test in France, we, we can check for the endometrial receptivity at the genetic level so it's not just the ultrasound level it's it's at the genetic level and we can see which when it is the best moment for the endometrium to receive uh, and implant an embryo also there are factors associated with um, 
the immunitary environment. Um, people are talking about NK cells, scare genes, um, KRI, KIR genes, sorry, um, and, um, and also thrombophilia, which are hematological factors and some uh, so, and also microbiota, meaning because all all women have bacteria in their inside their womb, we just have to make sure though, that those bacteria are the correct ones. So we have to make sure that they have at least eighty percent of lactobacils and no pathogenic bacterial development in there. If so, there are ways to test for all of those things. All of those issues are associated uh, with, uh, with implantation failure. And luckily, uh, most of them, I would say almost all of them have treatment. And, uh, and so there are solutions that can be explored. So I would say to Daniela, if one of your embryos or all of them is genetically viable, you shouldn't transfer it before uh, checking for all these other factors, given your past history of failed uh, embryo transfers. All right, thank you so much for that advice and your questions, of course, as well. Okay. And now we have another question, so let me get to it right away. Mm -hmm. I've had three IVF cycles using donor embryo sperm. I've had two miscarriages around five, six weeks. What kind of test should I be asking for? I am 50. Well, uh, uh, what can I say? Um, so, um, those miscarriages uh, were uh, Joanne had this miscarriages with donor embryos and, and donor sperm. Uh, so we're already talking about double donation. The odds that these are these have genetic causes uh, are little because with double donation most embryos are viable and so um, I would say it is it seems unlikely that the cause for this miscarriage is of a gen of genetic origin um, and so uh, I would focus uh, on what I've just said to test the endometrium to test for um, the, um, the window of implantation, the infectious causes, immunitary factors. I mean, we would have to make sure that the whole um, uh, immunitary, uh, I, I would check for um, factors at the level of the endometrium because it does seem unlikely that um, the miscarriages are caused by genetic reasons while talking about double donations. Okay, thank you so much again for this. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, let me have a look. Uh, yes, there's a, another question right here. What can you suggest to help improve egg quality? My embryos do not make it to blastocyst and I am poor responder. Thank you. Uh, that is uh, what we is, we we say uh, the million dollar question. Unfortunately, there's very little that we can do about this. Um, obviously, we have. Uh, I don't know how old is Helen. I don't know exactly um, uh, what are the the circumstances of her treatment. In some cases, uh, there are there is room for improvement. Uh, there is room for optimization uh, for optimization uh, in the in the ovarian stimulation. We can um, fourteen may single lady. Okay, <laughs> thank you, Alan. Um, so um, uh, we would have to see how was the ovarian stimulation. There are different ways of stimulating women's ovaries. Um, some in some cases. Uh, with poor responders, uh, for as strange as this, as this might seem, um, mild stimulation IVF sometimes gives good results. That's something that we can try. Uh, we can also try different uh, protocols that yield different responses. Um, unfortunately, there are um, there is an ongoing discussion for years whether doing uh, sort of a priming treatment uh, with DHEA could improve air quality. A lot of initial studies uh, pointed in that direction. However, uh, randomized controlled trials have failed to prove that those kind of treatments were really effective. 
Um, so in practical terms, um, I, I would say that the best strategy to get Ellen to be pregnant with her own eggs would be to bank as many eggs as possible. Uh, sometimes we can do repeated stimulations uh, in our, we always tell our patients that we should aim to, to get 10 eggs, okay? Uh, sometimes it's difficult, they have like one or two eggs at a time, uh, but we can try to work with what we have. Um, we culture the embryos, we do PGTA, that would be one of the of the options. Um, so, but unfortunately, if that happens repeatedly, um, I mean, there are lots of vitamins and other theories. People, patients have to be healthy, as healthy as they can. Uh, they have to be a good, they, they have to have a normal BMI. I mean, those are the issues that we can control. Um, but if every, uh, but sometimes we all of that is already assured. Patients live healthy lives, uh, he healthy lifestyles. They don't smoke. They don't drink. They they have a normal BMI, and still their ovaries don't work. Um, we can use those vitamin supplements that there are in the market. Unfortunately, their effect will not be radical. Um, uh, we can try to bank some eggs. We can try those strategies with DHEA. But at the end of the day, um, uh, our hope is that maybe there is room for improvement on the ovarian stimulation level. Um, but um, sometimes the only solution would be to move on to, to egg donation. We would have to, to, to assess her case individually in order to be able to, to properly reply. But unfortunately, there's not much we can do sometimes. All right. Thank you again for your help with that as well. And uh, there's another question. Do clinics vary in technology uh, to help uh, pregnancy? Help achieve pregnancy? Uh, yes, of course. There are many new technologies. The IVF world is uh, always evolving. Uh, so nowadays, uh, for example, we have the embryoscope, which was a very unusual thing uh, five or six years ago. Um, so and now we can see the embryos dividing and developing from the moment the, the sperm gets into the egg uh, until the mo uh, and we can see the embryos evolving without touching them, without manipulating them, always providing them with the best and more stable environment. Uh, uh, so um, that, uh, that, that's one of the most recent technologies. Uh, we also have things in the lab that uh, culture media, microscopes, uh, air filtration systems. Uh, I mean, the IVF lab is, is, in, is being increasingly optimized from a technological point of view. So obviously there are clinics that have everything which is new and more recent, uh, which I believe <laughs> will be our case. Uh, but, uh, and there are obviously clinics that don't have the same conditions for financial reasons, because they are sometimes uh, in, in countries or institutions that don't have access to, to those kind of technologies. So, I mean, there is uh, obviously a limit until which technology is important. Uh, if you ask every doctor or embryologist, he will cert certainly tell you that he would prefer to uh, to all of the state-of-the-art technology. Uh, there's no question about that. However, at the end of the day, uh, we have to remember that the first IVF child was born in 1978. She will be 42 years this year, this year and the conditions were terrible. So uh, if the eggs and the sperm are good, life finds a way, okay? Um, so sometimes technology is not that important. Uh, it is also very important, the psychological factors, the type of care, the, 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 the stimulation strategy. I mean, this is all part, part of a 
process that includes the medical staff, the nurses, the psychologists, um, the, the technology is only the tip of this process. It is a very important one and we always want to, to provide our patients with the best possible conditions. However, uh, sometimes um, that's not enough and uh, uh, I don't think uh, if technology alone was the solution, then it would be very easy. You just throw money in a clinic and you will be immediately get babies uh, from there, which is not the case. It's very important to have good doctors and nurses and the rest of the staff. So. Perfect. Thank you so okay. much again. That's true. It's uh, not only uh, one person <laughs> that matters, right? Yes, Perfect. obviously. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. Uh, so can you tell us about our donors of MERS Ambrose available and is there a waiting list? Um, yes and no. <laughs> uh, okay, sure. yes, there are donor embryos available and no, there is not a waiting list. Uh, here in Portugal, um, embryos can be frozen for three years and afterwards they can be donated to other patients. Um, do embryos donated, most of them are anonymous. Uh, that happens because, uh, as I said in the beginning, it was in 2018, exactly two years ago today, that our legislation changed. And so the most recent uh, frozen embryos that we have have been frozen, uh, avail which are already available for donation, have been frozen on the 24th of April 2017. So uh, back then, the law uh, still required the anonymity of the donors. So uh, there are embryos available for donation, but they are from anonymous donors. Uh, and uh, there is no waiting list at the moment. But if you asked me that very same question a year ago, uh, I would say that there was a waiting list. Okay, this changes a lot. There are there is a lot of demand on those uh, donated embryos. Uh, obviously, we can we try to to assign them to our patients uh, as fast as possible. Um, but uh, as of today, we have uh, available embryos from all phenotypes that have been donated by other patients perfect thank you so much again mm -hmm. for this and can you give us tips on how to choose a clinic for the first time i am 42. well uh it's <laughs> as i said being the ceo of two clinics uh, i'm suspect to to answer this question um but um what I always tell uh, patients is this. Uh, nowadays, most of the clinics are doing uh, an excellent job. Okay, we have great, great clinics everywhere. Uh, there are uh, lots of clinics working with the most recent technologies and brilliant doctors. So, um, I mean, uh, so I would say that uh, you should choose a clinic that has access to the most recent technologies uh, uh, a clinic that uh, it's like the the tv show the shears uh, where a clinic where everybody knows your name they remember the song from from the shears introduction um, it's important to have personalized treatment because patients are are not numbers and we need to know their names what happens in their lives uh, and you know we have to have a direct connection we have to be able to call the patients the the nurses the doctors the, the embryologists and ask for information we have to find a direct um, a direct connection uh, to the um, to the clinic so i would say that is a very important factor obviously you should choose uh, some clinic where uh, the availability of technology is a good indicator uh, of the the kind of commitment that the clinic has to provide a good service so uh, experienced doctors people that are in the field for several years clinics with a good infrastructure i mean uh, obviously we don't 
want to to do treatment in a factory of babies because that's not something that's personalized but uh, it's important uh, to have a certain um, a certain number of cycles done because some of the techniques that we use like for example embryo vitrification and warming they require a lot of practice uh, at Ferti Center, for example we warm and freeze thousands and thousands of eggs and embryos every year uh, there is no single day that uh, where we don't do that uh, including weekends uh, so um, it's very um, important to have a good number of cases so we can have the experience and the skills to to provide a good service um, on top of that uh, i think we it's very important to have uh, trust in the clinic a good communication with the clinic and obviously experienced and skilled staff perfect thank you so much for providing all those details again very important uh, that's mm -hmm. what you have mentioned for sure mm -hmm. okay and now let's go to the next question could you provide an idea of how much egg donation costs your clinic how long does the process take in terms of choosing donor through to embryo transfer uh, well, those are um, <laughs> these are many questions uh, inside this uh, for for Michelle. So, um, trying to organize the ideas. How much egg donation costs? It will depend on the program. Our standard program costs around six thousand euros uh it's it goes uh it includes and then we have different protocols um well uh, there are some add-ons that can be added to the cost like using the embryoscope for example but i mean with all the possible add-ons it will no it will not go above six thousand and five hundred euros um however there are other possibilities you can hire a guarantee for example if you want to hire a five blastocyst guarantee uh, in that case it will cost you more i don't know the costs by heart but it's certainly around ten thousand euros uh, what's that uh, what is a guarantee obviously we always do our best we try to stimulate the next donor in the best way possible we, we try to get as many eggs as we can uh, without putting the donor cells at risk and we try to fertilize all of our eggs with the male partners or the sperm donor sperm in order to get as many good quality eggs as we can however since we're work, working in biology sometimes that's not enough and we don't get uh, those five blastocysts that we agreed in that case what happens the patient is entitled to a new cycle with a new donor without additional costs okay so this these are financial guarantees because from a biological point of view we always do the same we always we don't have better or worse donors all of our donors have been uh, thoroughly uh, evaluated and approved and they are always considered to be at the same level with the same likelihood of pregnancy um, so um, this is the difference in costs our standard program include normally if there is no male factor we may uh, or no significant male factor uh, we assure a minimum of two blastocysts and six eggs okay this is what we call our standard program um, regarding how long the process takes um, i mean it could be <laughs> very quick uh, i remember one case where a patient called me uh, it was uh, from finland and she said uh, i'm already in the middle of my ovarian stimul uh, of my endometrial preparation and um, i had a problem with my clinic and i want to continue treatment with you uh, would that be possible to be done in in a week from now <laughs> and then it was a double donation obviously and she sent me all of the um, the tests that she had done the ultrasound scans we've communicated with her doctor she sent us the ultrasounds the serology reports we've had all the information we had the approval of her doctor and we said okay 
So uh, the next day uh, we fertilized eggs from our egg bank uh, with sperm from our sperm bank. Five days later, we were transferring the embryos and the, the patient came down from Finland. She got pregnant and she came back to Finland the same day. Uh, I mean, this is an extreme case, uh, but uh, usually we prefer to do things with time uh, in so normally since we don't have waiting lists we ask the patients information on our, on their medical history we evaluate them we, we will probably have an online consultation with them those are free of charge uh, just to discuss uh, what we need we can request additional testing uh, if something is missing we can we might need com to communicate with the patients on doctor and then um, choosing a donor usually takes a day. We suggest the donor, uh, if the patient accept it, accepts it, it's done. Uh, and then it depends on clinical aspects of the patient. So usually from the first day of the period until the day of the embryo transfer, it takes between 20 and 21 days. It's the, it's the typical length of time for biological reasons to prepare an endometrium. We always prefer to have the embryos created before, so uh, normally we ask the male partner to come over, leave the sperm sample, so we can create the embryos beforehand. Uh, we can also do it in a synchronized cycle. The difference between um, uh, what we call a deferred cycle or a freeze-all cycle and a synchronized cycle would be the uncertainty, because uh, if there's some problem with the donor, if she makes a mistake, if she doesn't produce enough quality eggs and so on, we can always uh, move to another donor, obviously with the patient's approval. While if we're doing a synchronized cycle, we have to wait for the egg pickup to see how many eggs we're going to get. And every day we'll be, uh, we will have new information. So uh, it's impossible to predict uh, what would be the quality of the embryos five days or six days later. Okay, so usually um, replying directly to Michelle, I would say that uh, starting a process from zero, uh, the moment between starting a, a process from zero and receiving the embryo transfer, usually can take between a month to a month and a half, assuming that there are no constraints on the clinical side for, for the patient. All right, perfect. Thank you so much again for this yeah. information. Mm -hmm. And uh, let's go for the next one. Can a donor seek information about the child born using their genetic material? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, no, 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 sorry. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, I was reading it the other way around. No, no, the donor cannot seek that information. Uh, it, it's forbidden. So the donor, um, uh, donors have absolutely no rights over the child that are born. And they can also not uh, seek the, not request that kind of information. However, uh, they, if a donor, uh, the donor signs a document where he or she uh, states that if she, if like in the case of egg donors, if she has uh, some genetic disease that is found after the donation occurred, she she will inform the clinic. Okay, so uh, in those cases, uh, the families will immediately be notified uh, about something that's been found out lately. Uh, luckily, we've never had that until today, uh, but that can happen. And, the, and this is why the, the IVF authorities are there, so to make sure that everything goes well. Um, so uh, to make clear, <laughs> my initial, I, I was reading, uh, uh, I was not reading the, the question correctly. Uh, no, the donor cannot seek information about children. They don't even know whether there are any children born from their donations. Okay, thank you for clarifying this. Thanks okay. so much. And uh, let's go to the next question. So which is more viable and has more chances of a successful pregnancy, fresh or frozen transfer? Um, Normally, um, uh, 
the chances of uh, now we're talking about embryo survival um, nowadays uh, the embryo survival rates with the vitrification methods are always as above 95 percent uh, we have um, very uh, very often we are even above 98 uh, percent we have an uh, above 98 percent rate of survival so um, and if the embryo survives well to the vitrification process to the freezing process uh, the chances of implant of implantation are the same as before uh, the embryo transfer as before the the vitrification so um, uh, i would say it is the same according to our experience it is the same and actually nowadays the tendency worldwide is to do more and more frozen transfers instead of fresh transfers because while we are doing frozen transfer we have time to prepare the endometrium to, to optimize uterine conditions to receive the embryos and so sometimes we're doing frozen transfer um, just for uh, just to optimize the endometrium we're doing it as an elective procedure so we could perfectly do it fresh but we prefer to do it frozen because that will uh, give will allow us to to do a better endometrial preparation it is also it it has also been shown that children born from frozen embryo transfer uh, tend to to have better um, better parameters uh, while they are born in terms of time of pregnancy um, weight at birth birth weight uh, and so on then children born from fresh uh, embryo transfer so uh, and recently i was reading the statistics from the united states nowadays more than 70 percent of all egg donation cycles are done with frozen embryo transfers uh, the reason why everybody is doing this is because not only it takes a lot of uncertainty from the process but also because this allows us to optimize the endometrium so uh, in order to respond to Kyra, i would definitely prefer to do frozen embryo transfers uh, rather than than fresh ones uh, but um, the uh, uh, it is a personal opinion probably some other clinics will think otherwise i don't know but uh, the tendency worldwide is uh, towards frozen embryo transfers okay Thank you so much for uh, sharing this information with us. Definitely interesting as well. And um, next question is, can I use a member of my family as a donor? Unfortunately not, because even though no donors are not anonymous, uh, they, they are anonymous for the parents. The only person that has the right to get access to the donor's ID is the child born from the donation. Okay, so unfortunately that's not possible okay thank you for clearing this up and this is about the donors and you said you have donors from france does this include martinique or Guadeloupe, the french islands uh, actually we don't have donors from martinique or Guadeloupe at this very moment uh, we do have a lot of patients from martinique uh, or Guadeloupe. Um, and uh, and we do have donors that match those characteristics because here in Portugal uh, we have a, a population of people coming from Brazil, uh, people coming from Cape Verde. Uh, so there, I always tell patients that we were. Uh, probably the first country uh, we were the first country starting globalization uh, 500 years ago so uh, this is why we have so many phenotypes in our egg bank and sperm bank uh, in Portugal we have direct relationships with lots of countries well in South America Brazil obviously uh, in in Africa countries such as Cape Verde Angola Mozambique and so on and from those countries uh, even India, we, we have uh, people with some characteristics that can be used in that are more typical in Martinique or Guadeloupe. Uh, we do have a lot of patients from those islands. 
All right, perfect. Thank you so much. Thank and you. there's a question about, so you have also donated members of other phenotypes, not only Caucasian? Obviously, obviously. Uh, we do, we even have Asian phenotype donors available. Uh, not that many, but um, we have black donors, white donors, mixed race donors. There's absolutely no problem. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much for yeah. clarifying that to us as well. Mm -hmm. Next question is AF, AFC is 8, AMH is over 8. Can we freeze on day 3 to be able to bank? Uh, okay, I, I think Helen was asking this uh, as a follow-up information on her previous question. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, so um, this, uh, I, I'm assuming that these AMH units are picomol per liter, uh, otherwise it would be fantastic uh, if it was nanograms per milliliter, um, but um, AFC of 8 is, I mean, probably a sign of um, it's okay. We ha we've had pregnancies with a lot worse than that. Um, normally, uh, we can uh, normally not normally here in Portugal we cannot bank embryos. We can freeze eggs and accumulate eggs and then free, uh, fertilize all the frozen uh, and fresh eggs at the same time. But we cannot create embryos. Uh, again, uh, we cannot accumulate embryos before uh, transferring them into the womb. So, what w we would advise in this case would be to freeze the eggs and then move on with fertilization later. This, this would also be a lot cheaper because for every time we create uh, an embryo, it is a new ICSI procedure while uh, freezing eggs and then doing one ICSI procedure will be significantly less expensive. Okay, perfect. Thank you again for answering this question. We will be slowly finishing, although we have like a few questions left. Uh, so if you if you have any questions, this would be like a final call. So go ahead and type them in and uh, let's go to the next question. My periods are changing in length and schedule. They are getting shorter, lighter and farther apart. I am 45. Can I still do the egg donation? I had a natural birth at 36. Um, I mean, we would have to evaluate the, the ovarian reserve of Connie in order to see um, whether she's still producing, uh, her eggs are still, her ovaries are still working or not. Um, so um, those signs uh, are not good, okay? Um, the, this is pro those are probably signs, the fact that her periods are changing in length and getting shorter, lighter and further apart. Those are probably signs of um, ovarian insufficiency coming on. Um, so um, I would say to Connie, you need to to move on as soon as quickly as possible. Uh, I would definitely uh, recommend that you do an ovarian reserve assessment, uh, which includes the AMH hormone FSH, um, and those would be the the two most and antro follicle count, obviously. Uh, so we can have an idea whether it is still possible to stimulate you or not. Uh, I would say that if FSH is below than 10, it would be great. Uh, if uh, AMH is above 0 0.5 nanograms per milliliter, it will also be uh, good. And in that case, we can still do an ovarian stimulation. But we definitely shouldn't waste time. And um, yesterday was better than today, and it would be worse than tomorrow. I mean, we're now running against time, so it's certainly advisable to to put things in motion as soon as possible. Okay, um, unless you decide to go uh, via the the embryo donation path, the, the egg donation path, uh, in that case, there's no problem. We still have time. But uh, still, uh, I, according, by reviewing this question, I, I'm assuming that Connie wants to try with her own eggs. 
so I will definitely uh, check for that and uh, will also definitely recommend the, the egg donation, the, the PGTA assessment, so we can see whether the embryos produced are viable or not. Perfect. Thank you so much for your advice. And there are two very similar questions. Okay, so let me show you the first one and right after it, the next one. So can you implant two embryos at once in your clinic and transferring two blastocysts can increase the chances of pregnancy? It's risky after 40? Uh, the answer uh, is yes, we can implant two embryos at once. It's the maximum that our legislation allows. Uh, however, uh, it is a decision based also on clinical criteria. So if a woman has a, I mean, a small uterus or some other risk factor, we would definitely recommend just one embryo. Okay, uh, But we don't close the door to double embryo transfers. We would have to 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 assess the embryo quality, the personal history of the patient, and we do a lot of double uh, embryo transfers, uh, but uh, we always try to avoid twin pregnancies. Um, transferring to blastocysts can obviously increase the chance of a pregnancy. Uh, we have to think that uh, every blastocyst has an, an individual likelihood of implantation. So uh, every single blastocyst has more or less a 60% chance of being euploid, um, according to recent studies. And so um, since the odds of implantation are individual, uh, after transferring one blastocyst at a time two times or after transferring two blastocysts uh, at the same time, the number of implanted blastocysts would theoretically be the same. However, there are two things to, that should be considered while taking this decision. First of all, um, the risk of twin pregnancy. With two blastocysts, there is a significant risk of twin pregnancy. Uh, second of all, um, if there is a problem, let's say, in the window of implantation, by transferring two blastocysts at the same time, we would risk to waste both blastocysts, okay? While if we transfer one and we have a negative result, there's still time to correct whatever could be wrong and then do the, the second embryo transfer under better conditions. So it's a hard call, but um, it can be considered. Uh, I mean, we have to take these decisions on an individual basis. For example, if Patricia has a previous record of um, failed embryo transfers with negative results, I would say that transferring two blastocysts would be be acceptable. However, if we're talking about two blastocysts coming from egg donation treatments uh, with a very with brilliant quality, I would say that it is certainly better to transfer just one at a time. So there is not a definitive as definite answer to this question. We really have to to assess. Of course, perfect. Thank you so much uh, again for that. And there's another question. So what can be done to increase the thickness of the endometrium? Well, this is another million dollar question because mm -hmm. uh, endometrial thickness issues are one uh, are, are the worst kind of problems that we have uh, in our clinic. So uh, we need the endometrium to be, well, we want the endometrium to be at least eight millimeters thick. Uh, if it is seven, we're already relatively happy because in, with seven millimeters, the, result, the results are already very acceptable. If it is less than seven, um, chances tend to to low to drop significantly um, what can we do to increase the thickness of the endometrium there are several protocols uh, we can try protocols with increasing dosages of estrogens then we will also have to balance that with the risk of side effects uh, there are a lot of um, other drugs that can be used like vitamin E, pentoxifilin, sildenafil. So there are different things that can be added to the protocol that in some 
particular patients uh, have given best better results sometimes we have patients uh, i was um, recently we had a patient that um, where we we never had good quality good quality endometriums we kept canceling cycles and then we decided to try with a natural cycle and without us knowing why the endometrium grew perfectly and we transferred her the embryo and she immediately got pregnant and the pregnancy is already at around 20 weeks or so so um uh, unfortunately there are still cases where endometriums never grow uh, above four or five millimeters there are some experiments and some 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 experiences being done um, some trials being done uh, with uh, stem cells in especially in japan that make the endometrium grow but the results are um, well we don't have good results for that until now okay thank you in the meantime i have shown you the next question this was quite similar you have already uh, yeah it's it's uh, the same answer so we can try to improve the protocol we would have to see what has been done until now maybe there is room for improvement there maybe there's not um those stem cell therapies uh, i mean there are groups in the, in japan also in scotland uh, in spain as well but they are still experimental those are not routine procedures that we can offer patients mm -hmm. okay thank you so much again for that okay. And let's go there. Are, like there is this question and one more. So, can a patient choose a donated embryo, or is always the clinic staff that makes the choice according to the phenotype? Um, well, it's a dialogue. Uh, we we talk to the patient. Uh, we tell her. Uh, uh, a little bit of the story of that embryo obviously we will not tell who their parents are but we will tell something like this is a, a couple where the lady is was 34 and the man was uh, 35 for instance um they had uh, they had a baby they don't want to have any more babies and so they have donated this extra embryo uh, they are Caucasian, one meter eighty-five, uh, and uh, I mean, we would show the phenotypic characteristics of the parents, and we will suggest that embryo based on the patient's characteristics. Okay, so uh, we cannot provide patients with a list of available embryos, so they can choose one. Uh, it's not like that but we we try to match the the recipient's characteristics with the embryo's characteristics obviously the embryos come the embryo comes from two different persons uh we have mixed couples that are also donating their embryos so um we do have to to balance that with them um, it's it's always a joint deci a, a decision taken together with the patient who receives it Perfect. Fantastic. Thank you so much for answering yeah. and explaining how it works as well. And this will be our final question for today. Uh, so let me get to it. So with the COVID-19 situation, is your clinic open for transfers? Are we allowed to go to Portugal from the US? Also, does your clinic allow shipping of embryos? Um, okay. Uh, starting from the beginning, uh, 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 with the COVID-19 situation, is our clinic open for transfers? Yes, we are. Uh, actually, um, uh, yesterday, the Portuguese Society for Reproductive Medicine uh, just announced that uh, clinics, uh, that recommended that clinics uh, should restart their activity. Um, at Ferti Centro, we have never closed the clinic during this period. In Portugal, it wasn't legally required required to close clinics. However, we've postponed most treatments. We have done only the most urgent procedures and we were like doing 5% of our activity. Uh, it was our responsibility with patients to uh, that had more urgent cases. And so uh, 
uh, we lowered very significantly uh, our activity. We have implemented uh, all the um, all the health authorities' recommendations. So a lot of caution cautionary measures, and uh, we've changed a lot of internal procedures. But we're we're still working. Now uh, we're more comfortable because uh, the I mean. We're seeing even yesterday or maybe today uh, in Spain, the, the Spanish Society for Reproductive Medicine also announced that, that the Spanish clinics will also open. Last week, Denmark also announced that their clinics would be opening. In Germany and Austria, they also didn't close clinics. So, uh, but I mean, everywhere uh, clinics reduced uh, their activity and now they are resuming their activity in the us unfortunately things are a little worse than in europe uh, the, the 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 pandemic is still growing um so um yes you are allowed to go to portugal from the us there are not so many flights at this moment i think they but we're but we're getting i think as long as you can travel you can do treatment here regarding uh, shipping of embryos uh, it will depend we also have to issue a request to the national ivf authorities either to send or to receive embryos so we do allow shipping of embryos we have done that in the past uh, but it is very uh, there are very uh, a lot of bureaucratic steps to be taken uh, and we do need to to address that because there are uh, a lot of bureaucracy in both in the us and the portuguese side um, but um, patient uh, oh shipping the embryos from Prague in that case there would be no problem uh, inside the European Union there's absolutely no problem uh, so we can receive them tomorrow well tomorrow it's Saturday but uh, we can receive the embryos anytime there's no problem with that okay Perfect. Thank you so much. I know I've said it's the last question, uh, <laughs> but if you could just take a look. So are the couples happy to to uh, donate uh, the embryos to a single lady? Uh, of course, but the, the patients don't know to whom uh, they mm -hmm. are donating. Okay. okay. They, they just say that they, they make the embryos available for donation and then we donate them. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, one more thing. Uh, if you have any uh, live birth success rate in your clinic at hand, I'm not sure. Uh, well, uh, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll. I'll reply to that in the boss. Yes. Yes, we can way do it. Uh, yes. Okay. So um, to clarify. Success rates depend on a lot of issues. If we're talking about treatment with own eggs or if we're talking about treatment with egg donations. According to all statistics from all countries, Europe, United States, Australia, I mean, everywhere, uh, Spain, Portugal, Czech Republic, I mean, all the countries where uh, egg donation is more usual, we always get from 60 to 70 percent uh, of success rates rates. Uh, live birth rates differ from implantation rates because we have to count with the miscarriage rates. The miscarriage rates, when we're talking, uh, it's typically around 7 or 8 percent, and it also depends on the age of the patient. So, um, this this is the limit of the biology these are obviously we can isolate groups of patients where we have 80 percent of pregnancy rate and also groups of patients where we have five or ten percent of pre, uh, of live birth rates so uh, I, I would rather talk uh, with patients individually um, recently within one uh, one patient's association did a survey uh, just to confirm the success rates between their members in our clinic and out of 300 cycles or so uh, we've had 71 percent but 
it was lucky, okay, because we know that 71% is above the average. What we can expect is something between 60 and 70. It changes according to patients' conditions, treatment conditions, whether there's an L factor or not. Um, and so this is of little value. Obviously, if we're transferring two blastocysts to all patients, we will get a better pregnancy rate, uh, but also a lot of complications for our patients. So um, I would say that we have, uh, when we are thinking about success rates, we have to start thinking about biology. And biology gives us 60 to 70. Uh, Nowadays, if a clinic has a certain level of ex experience and activity, I would say around 1,000 cycles a year, uh, I would say mm, mm, embryologists and doctors working for more than 10 years in the field, uh, I would say uh, having the embryoscope or another time-lapse technology with perfect lab conditions, uh, working with the best culture and media, the best vitrification techniques, uh, then every clinic uh, will be around this these pregnancy rates. Uh, there is a lot of publici publicity around that, um, but we know because that's what the official statistics say, worldwide everybody's getting the same pregnancy rates without little little variations okay so uh when we talk about pregnancy with own eggs um i was uh, this week i was actually reviewing a statistic uh it will depend after the age of 42 it's certainly uh, below five percent or uh, something around that. Um, now we're getting also um, very unusual cases because uh, with single women and lesbian couples, we have a lot of patients who are not infertile, meaning that they have never tried to have a baby and they are trying for the first time at a later age. And so um, they are generally better prognosis patients that lift the pregnancy rates up. Uh, so uh, we do need to know the ovarian reserve. I prefer to reply to, that, to this question based on ovarian reserve, age, uterine conditions, and previous history, so we, we can give an honest preview to the, to the patient. Because success rates can come uh, from many factors, and there are many confounding factors. I always give this example. I know that this <laughs> intervention is probably taking too long. Uh, if we have uh, 10 embryos uh, on day one, and only two of them are viable, but we don't know that. Uh, we will, if we will have a 20% pregnancy rate. If we culture those embryos until day three, maybe we are able under the, the embryoscope to identify that uh, four or five of them are not good. And so maybe on day three, we have only, let's say six embryos uh, and two of them are still viable. So chances have risen from 20 to 33%. If we further culture those embryos until day five, maybe we have four blastocysts. And so it's two out of four and we have 50%. But they are always still the very same embryos, okay? So we are playing with statistics. With the same, the exact same embryos, we can move from, 20, from a 20% pregnancy rate into a 50% pregnancy rate, okay? So it's very easy to trick statistics. And we also know that we, if we play with accumulated pregnancy rates, after three blastocyst transfers, uh, each one giving 60%, if this is just math mathematics, we will get a 90% accumulated pregnancy rate, uh, a 93% pre accumulated pregnancy rate. So, um, I mean, uh, and still, it's it's also a sixty percent pregnancy rate uh, per embryo transfer, but a ninety percent, ninety three percent accumulated pregnancy rate. So, um, we we have to be careful while looking at statistics, yes. and we do need to 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 think that we're working with biology, and biology gives us. 60 to 70 percent unfortunately uh, as of today we don't get more than that 
Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. Definitely on point. Uh, this is a very a tricky yeah. um, situation with success rate. So thank you so much for answering this uh, okay. question. And we will be finishing for today. And there are also uh, plenty of thank yous, uh, Dr. Vladimiro. It has yeah. been a pleasure to have you here. You have been excellent. And this is not only uh, my... <laughs> Uh, my, I uh, would say, um, feeling okay. Fantastic okay. webinar. I love your idea, open donors in Portugal. Well, there's yeah. also a message uh, in Portuguese. I'm not going to read it. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> but only nice words, right? <laughs> yes, only nice words. Exactly. Um, yeah. So there are more thank you. So I just want you to see. Thank you for your kind words. Uh, so we are really <laughs> well. Thank you, everybody. I'm feeling actually embarrassed with all of this. Um, well, no need. For sure. it, it was it was really nice to be here and to to reply to all of these questions uh, i mean i don't know if if any of these persons wants to write me directly i will be very happy to reply to them and talk to them on the phone please feel free to do so perfect yes and remember you can just simply use the link i have sent in the chat section and that's where you will be able to get in touch with dr vladimiro and his team and as you know they are also able to offer you free line consultations so get in touch if you are interested of course and well more of those so <laughs> thank you so much again uh, i i know that we will have another uh, possibility to and also another webinar with dr uh, vladimiro already soon <laughs> so yeah. so i'm very happy and looking uh, forward to this uh, again huge thanks and just let me remind everyone that we are not done yet for today we have another uh, event very very soon at 8 p.m uk time so uh, stay tuned with us and i hope to see you at but also a uh, huge thank you to to all of you for joining our uh, event tonight well it has been great thank you so much and have a lovely lovely evening as well bye bye thank you bye bye